coming up on Court to Court. And indeed with electronic filing, the level of service that we're able to provide has actually increased dramatically. Why didn't you guys just come and talk to me? Why don't you have to go behind my back and put all this stuff down on paper? Doing this volunteering makes me feel that it's just, it's much more than a job, it's like a, a family here. This is Court to Court, your connection to what's happening in the federal courts around the country, providing information and ideas that will enhance your job and how the courts function. Now with today's program, Michael Burney. Welcome to Court to Court. This is one of two educational magazine programs that the Federal Judicial Center will air from time to time to supplement our growing curriculum of teletraining programs. The companion series, Perspectives, will feature up-to-date information on matters affecting the probation and pretrial services systems. We have an exciting program lined up for you today. We'll tell you more about the FJTN, point you in the direction of some helpful information about the SERS and FERS open season, hear from two electronic case prototype courts, and much more. So let's get started. As the administrative office of the U.S. courts moves forward with the installation of satellite downlinks in the courts, we are getting more requests for information about the new Federal Judicial Television Network. Many of you want to know, what is the FJTN? Our first segment will help answer that question. Okay, stand by. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, roll VTR. And take it. Welcome to the Federal Judicial Television Network. FJTN is a joint effort of the Federal Judicial Center, the Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts, and the U.S. Sentencing Commission. We'd like to tell you a little about the network and how it will change what our agencies do for you. Let's start with a quick look at the technology that's making all this possible. What you're seeing and hearing are video and audio signals that beam from the uplink to a satellite orbiting high above the Earth. The satellite then relays the signals back down to Earth, where they can be picked up by your court's downlink dish and come directly to you. The administrative office plans to put downlinks in more than 200 courts nationwide. Even before the network existed, the Federal Judicial Center produced a number of educational satellite broadcasts. Chances are you've already seen at least one of those programs. The July 1997 review of the Supreme Court's just concluded term, the first of the Special Needs Offenders series on street gangs, or perhaps leadership in the courts. But to see those programs, you had to travel across town or even farther. Now, with FJTN, you'll be able to watch similar educational programs right in your courthouse or in a court nearby. And you'll be better able to fit them into your schedule because they'll be short, typically half an hour to an hour. A new type of information program is also in the works. Magazine shows will let you know periodically what's happening in other courts and offices and explore issues important to your job. We're planning two of these, court to court for all court employees and perspectives for probation and pretrial services personnel. Let us know what you're doing to improve the work of your court or office, and you may find yourself the subject of a feature. And now that the courts will be able to receive broadcasts directly, we can also introduce an entirely new kind of programming teletraining. By broadcasting interactive distance learning from our new specially equipped instructor studio, FJTN will provide many more learning opportunities for many more court staff. You'll be able to keep your knowledge and skills at top level without taking time away from your job and your family to travel for training. This kind of distance learning preserves the best features of live training. By using the push to talk system, you'll be able to interact with your instructors just as if you were in the same classroom. Sometimes these instructors will include experts and officials that you wouldn't ordinarily have access to. And you'll be learning not only from the instructors, but from your colleagues, people like you doing the same job all over the country. In fact, 
because teletraining groups can be put together without regard to the cost of an airline ticket, you may get to exchange ideas with more people from farther away than you typically did in travel-based training. Having a conversation with an instructor you see on a TV screen is bound to seem a little strange at first, but we hope you'll plunge right in. Think of it as what it is, a real classroom with real people that just happens to be connected by satellite. So ask your questions, share your ideas and experiences, give us your feedback, and remember that FJTN is here for you. As we've just seen, the FJTN gives us two dynamic educational options. This magazine format is one option, and the teletraining format, which allows for more direct interaction, is the other. You may access information about upcoming programs from the FJC homepage on the JNET at the address on your screen. We will upgrade this information regularly, and we encourage you to check the site often. We'll give this address to you again later in the program. Now for our next segment. About 1.2 million federal employees, including many court employees, are eligible to transfer their retirement options from SERS to FERS during the upcoming open season. The Federal Office of Personnel Management is preparing government employees to make informed decisions on their retirement system options. Through national broadcasts, OPM is providing information to personnel specialists and federal employees. Court personnel officers are also participating in seminars conducted by the Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts, so they can help court employees understand their options. One of the most valuable tools available is the Handbook of Transfer Options, which will be made available to you through several sources. The AO's Human Resources Division has arranged to provide the following FERS transfer educational materials to all judicial branch SERS employees. OPM's FERS Transfer Open Season Handbook, a chart that lists available FERS transfer information and target transmittal dates, and a personalized letter providing SERS and FERS annuity comparisons based on some predetermined assumptions. All of this information will be mailed to your home address if you are a SERS judiciary employee. Some of you may already have received it. The OPM has a very helpful website from which you can download the transfer handbook. Highlights of the handbook include excellent explanations of the differences between the FERS and SERS coverage. The handbook is written primarily for employees who have a choice between SERS, SERS offset, and FERS coverage. Many employees with long-term federal service will have this option. In addition to the handbook and the information on the OPM website, your benefits coordinator will have additional information available after July 1st. That information will include videotaped copies of the first three OPM satellite broadcasts, a CD-ROM, which provides the entire revised SERS and FERS handbook and will be available in personnel and payroll offices. An interactive CD-ROM of federal benefits, which you can use to quickly and easily obtain clear, concise answers to many questions. AO satellite broadcasts of FERS and SERS training tapes. An AO satellite broadcast covering the FERS open season training issues. AO video conferencing materials and fax and email mailboxes for benefits coordinators to use when they need more information before answering questions about the FERS transfer. As you can see, HRD is providing many avenues through which you can get the information you need. SERS judiciary employees are strongly encouraged to use all of the available resources in preparing to make a transfer decision. The first step, which we hope we helped with in this segment, is to be aware of the information available to you. The second step is to seek out this information and to give yourself enough time to review each resource step by step. Only you can make a choice that will best fit with your future plans. For more information, be sure to check with your personnel office and don't forget about the OPM website. Those of you eligible to take advantage of this opportunity should look for more information from the AO to keep up with new developments and to help you make your decision. The Administrative Office and the Judicial Conference Committee on Automation and Technology continue to work with courts across the country to help develop electronic case filing capabilities in the federal courts. Four district courts and five bankruptcy courts are participating in the prototype efforts. The district courts are the Western District of Missouri, Eastern District of New York, Northern District of Ohio, and the District of Oregon. The bankruptcy courts are the District of Arizona, the Southern District of California, the Northern District of Georgia, the Southern District of New York, and the Eastern District of Virginia Alexandria Division. 
The district and bankruptcy courts in Albuquerque, New Mexico, are piloting a system they developed outside of the prototype program the other courts are participating in. The Northern District of Ohio helped get the effort started when it began piloting a system to work with the high paper volume generated in maritime asbestos cases. We visited two prototype courts to let you see how they are managing the transition to electronic filing. We first visited the district court in the Western District of Missouri. Here's what they had to say. ECF is a new format that we're using to file cases in the federal court. It actually stands for electronic case filing. It's a technique by which attorneys use the internet to actually dial up our computers and technically docket their own pleadings with the federal court. Currently we are asked to have 25 civil rights cases using the electronic case files prototype system and we have six active judges who are participating. Our judges are participating at different levels. We have several who have said put all of my cases in the program. We have some who have taken a wait and see attitude. We had to make sure that those judges who wanted to have paper copies of documents would continue to be able to have those paper copies. There was a need for the prototype courts to re-examine the federal rules of civil procedure and the local rules to accommodate electronic filing. Uh, we included in the rules committee um, three district judges, a magistrate judge, and a representative from the clerk's office. We thought it was important that the judges be involved early on in the process in the development of this program. The main rule issues that we had to identify were how to ensure authentication of documents that were electronically filed for purposes of Rule 11, for example. Um, what constituted a signature? And so we had to identify those things such as how to get the password that constituted the signature. That was included in the administrative order, while the rule itself indicated that the password would be the equivalent of a signature. We also had to be concerned about how to do notification. Once something was electronically filed, how did we ensure that the opposing party knew that something had been electronically filed? We decided that electronic notification was sufficient. I am Judge Lowry's courtroom deputy in the United States District Court for the Western District of Missouri. We currently have one case that is up and going on ECF uh, that's actually moving right along. Uh, the case uh, has had several motions filed in it. Uh, the court has issued uh, three or four orders in the case, so I've had an opportunity to process those orders. It's different in that the courtroom deputy has more involvement in processing the orders. Right now, um, whenever a motion is ruled on by the court issuing an order on a, an ECF case, uh, the order comes to the courtroom deputy and the courtroom deputy processes and dockets that order. What ECF has brought to us is the need for community outreach, uh, a public relations piece that we've never had before in the federal court system. What our court has done so far is created brochures and done mailings to area attorneys and provided demonstrations either at the court site or at attorney's law firm. My name is Bill Terry. I'm the operations manager for the Western District of Missouri. I'm going to show you how easy it is to file a motion using the electronic case filing system. First of all, we'll select Western District of Missouri document filing system from our homepage and we'll put our login ID and password in here. We've so far demonstrated ECF to over 800 individuals. Oh, the attorneys love it. The attorneys love ECF. Uh, it's so easy for them to use. The court's files are available to them 24 hours a day. There's no more running last minute to the courthouse. They get their orders and the other documents so quickly. Everybody wants to know how secure is this. Well, from the AO, we are hearing that the National Security Council has reviewed all the firewalls, all the connectivity, and determined that second only to their system, this is one of the most secure government operations they've seen. Right now we have 13 cases on here. We are still prototyping. We're approaching the end of the prototype period and the, the AO has used the prototype to measure volume and how is the security system working. Uh, we're hoping to get 25 cases on within the next 30 days. We're excited about being a prototype project because that means that we can develop the system as it goes. And we've already done that. Attorneys call us and say this didn't work for us so we're able to say we'll change it for you. And that is, that's just absolutely outstanding opportunity. It's been extremely easy to get those changes that we've needed 
because I've called the AO and like I said, sometimes within 24 hours, it's the way I wanted it to be. The culture of the court has changed because historically the, d the court has taken in an enormous amount of paper and created an enormous amount of paper. And right now we're moving to an electronic medium where there is no paper available. Uh, there was a situation where on our ECF case I did not get a motion that I needed. And in what I would normally do, this was a Jefferson City case, I would call Jefferson City and tell them to fax that motion to me. But since it was an ECF case, I was able to get into ECF, uh, click on that motion, and I printed the entire motion out just as it appears in the original file. So I could see it's going to be great. The enthusiasm we found on the district court side, we also found when we visited the Southern District of New York's bankruptcy court. Let's take a look. In the prototype for the Southern District of New York bankruptcy court, electronic case filing means that we're doing bringing text files to the court through the internet. So as much as possible, every document comes in an electronic format, in an electronic text format. Now, all Chapter 11 cases filed in 1998 go on the electronic case filing system. We have 409 cases. Now that, for us, a case is all bankruptcy, a bankruptcy case and an adversary proceeding. Any given day, between 650 to 700 people access our system. We're over 6,000 docket entries. There are quite a number of issues presented by moving from a paper to an electronic format. Uh, one of the most difficult and critical of those issues is what to do with Rule 11 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, which is also applicable in bankruptcy cases. Uh, that rule, of course, provides that an attorney's signature is a certification as to the uh, uh, good faith, in essence, behind the argument that the attorney is making or the factual assertion that the attorney is making. And what we finally uh, arrived at was to give out to each attorney rather than to each firm uh, a password to use the system and we have uh, implemented through our a standing order which I have signed um, a provision that says that the use of a password is uh, equivalent to a signature on a piece of paper and we have very carefully schooled the users of the system that they should not be willy-nilly giving their passwords out to just anybody but should keep control of them for that reason. Another of the issues concerned uh, when we still had to use paper because the federal rules of bankruptcy procedure in some instances provide that you have to give people notice of various milestones in cases uh, and, and most creditors don't have access to the internet or at least we don't know whether they have access to the internet. So we concluded that in certain types of matters we still had to use paper. We're pretty excited about the fact that we've trained over 500 attorneys to use the electronic case filing system and that a good portion of, that, of those 500 attorneys are using it. We offer training. The purpose of this presentation is to case We urge them to take training early on. Attorney's information. Case administrators much more are becoming quality reviewers. Rather than hands-on docketing, they are looking at what is being filed and offering guidance to attorneys on how to more economically file because the concept of docketing has changed. Initially when we started, the attorneys were a little apprehensive. After we gave them adequate training and one-on-one -on -one, um, help regarding the electronic filing, it was pretty much easy transition for them. The attorneys became more dependent on us Anything from technical questions to docketing questions, it was solely, um, we was in control of that. And once they knew they had ample help, everything was smooth. Basically, the support that we provide for the attorneys is anywhere from uh, installing of the application, installing of personal computers, and also uh, helping them docket their first motions. What excites me about electronic filing is that uh, the courts have taken a giant leap forward, and uh, I think we have taken the attorneys by storm at this point. I think the most exciting thing for me in, this, in putting this system in place was first the idea of creating something so new and so different. Moreover, our help desk, make sure that you get a live voice. When you call in, no voicemail, no promise to call back, but a live person, someone in automation who's prepared to hold your hand and take you through it. We will have our entire system, not only Chapter 11s, but 7s, 13s, 304s, 
every case that's filed here, we're going to have it on the system before December 1999. So in that sense, we are at the cutting edge. The greatest benefit is that it has enabled us to process an ever-growing caseload with an ever-diminishing staff. Um, frankly, we embarked on this project not because we thought it would be a novelty and a lark, but because it was absolutely essential for us. We were finding that we were having difficulty processing the uh, enormous amount of paper that came through the court, and we had to figure out a way to do this more effectively and efficiently while still providing to the bar the same level of service that we provided previously. And indeed, with electronic filing, the level of service that we're able to provide has actually increased dramatically because not only the judges, but uh, the public at large, anyone with access to the Internet, even if they have only a read-only password to the system, can see any of our documents at any time. Though both courts mentioned that there are still issues to be resolved concerning how to handle attachments and exhibits in electronically filed cases, both are optimistic that in time these challenges will be met. We can all learn from the prototype court's experiences. We'll keep you updated on the educational aspects of how the prototypes are advancing and look forward to visiting other prototype courts in future broadcasts. For our next segment, let me introduce you to my colleague, Bob Fagan. Thanks, Michael. In this segment, we'll be covering words to know. That is words that we may banner about all the time, but not necessarily share the same definition for. For example, today's words are internet and intranet. These words are used frequently, but often cause confusion, especially when some of us sort of know what they mean, but don't really want to ask because we don't want to appear uninformed. Well, fear not. After today, you won't have to ask. How to define the internet? It's been called a superhighway, complete with intersections and traffic being directed here and there. It's been referred to as a spider web and even a tidal wave over which one can surf. Interesting metaphors, but not really definitional. Rather, the Internet is a series of wires and connections blanketing the world that permits computer networks to talk to other computer networks and support different formats of transferring and receiving information. Once you subscribe to an Internet service, you can access any information that someone wants to put out there, and much of it is free. Many people use Internet and the World Wide Web interchangeably, and that can cause confusion. The web is a part of the Internet, and it permits information to be displayed through text, sound, pictures, animation, all with just a click. That's a simple explanation of the Internet. Oh, by the way, it's been estimated that there are presently more than 100 million folks accessing the Internet. 50 million of them are from the United States. Now let's turn to the word intranet. We're still talking wires, but this time with a finite set of connections and services. The intranet refers to a closed secured system that's limited to a defined number of locations and users. It's as if you've fenced in a portion of the Internet for your organization's sole use. In our case, this fenced-in secured area is called the Data Communications Network, or the DCN. That's the federal judicial branch's intranet. Approximately 23,000 court employees are users, and it includes both electronic mail and information from 100 court websites, as well as the FJC, AO, and the JNet. With an intranet, the court can keep certain information secured by determining who can access our sites. So, Internet means global, and the World Wide Web is part of it. Intranet means limited to a designated number of sites, and for us that means the Data Communications Network, the DCN. This is a simple way to remember the difference between these two words. There are many details we could go into about other differences between the two, but for this first session of Words to Know, we'll stop here. In future broadcasts, we'll cover additional basic words as well as more specialized terms. We hope you'll join us. Back to you, Michael. Thanks, Bob. At some point in our work, we all have to give feedback to our colleagues. Here's a preview of the center program Peer-to-Peer -Peer Feedback, a partnership for problem solving, a program designed to help us give more effective feedback. It really screws up my work when I can't get what I need from Ron. It seems like in the last few weeks he's just gotten lazy. Well, lately, whenever we get real busy at the front counter, he's frequently nowhere to be seen. And someone else, usually Barbara, ends up covering for him. 
Giving and receiving feedback is an integral part of work relationships. Depending on the approach you take, giving feedback can enhance or diminish the productivity of an individual, a team, or an organization. If given and received constructively, peer-to-peer -peer feedback enables you to effectively resolve work-related issues directly with your colleagues. These are the points that we all four agreed on that we want to talk with you about on Friday. Why didn't you guys just come and talk to me? Why don't you have to go behind my back and put all this stuff down on paper? An important part of the program's success depends upon planning one's feedback point by point so that it's not simply spontaneous and emotionally charged. The program's structure is designed to channel emotional responses into productive interaction. And, and I don't think it's unreasonable that you've had to cover for me three or four times, Barbara, since I've had to cover for you several times. It's been more than three or four times, Ron. Through a structured step-by-step -step process that requires a little training and practice, Colleagues can exchange supportive feedback on work behaviors that contribute to each other's productivity and corrective feedback on behaviors that hinder it. Based on that feedback, they can agree on specific, mutually satisfying changes in behavior. So way to go, team. For more information about peer-to-peer -peer feedback, a partnership for problem solving, contact Bob Luke at the Court Education Division of the Federal Judicial Center. 202-273-4104. In addition to making you aware of available educational programs, another goal of Court to Court is to let you know of innovative practices being tried throughout the federal judiciary. We hope to help you identify practices that you can examine in light of your court's needs. We visited both the probation and clerk's offices in the District of Columbia for our next segment, Exciting Practices. Several years ago, the District of Columbia District Court's Probation Office experienced a major staff downsizing. Naturally, afterwards, improving morale would be a challenge. But Probation Officer Fatimata Chime says the new Chief Probation Officer, Richard Houck, met that challenge and adopted a get-on-board attitude. And you have a captain at the ship who is saying, okay, now, in order to come out of this, everybody, everybody has got to to hold on to uh, this rope and um, pull together so we can come out and begin to sail on the seas. To get people involved, several techniques were used, such as forming work groups among all units in the office. Everyone, including support staff and uh, information system, uh, probation officers, managers, on every level everyone is doing is involved in some type of project. Also, a new emphasis was put on giving all employees a chance to upgrade and creatively use their skills. What excites me about the job now is that I see many, many opportunities, that I am allowed the flexibility to be creative. I'm excited because I love to do training. I love to teach and I see a lot of that coming about. I'm excited because it gives me the opportunity to do a lot of things that as a line officer, or even as a specialist, I would never uh, ordinarily get the opportunity to do. The court employees we spoke with say that giving people opportunities to be creative on the job is an effective way to keep morale high. In the clerk's office of the D.C. District Court, employees who perform well may request limited administrative leave to do community volunteer work. The leave is only granted after office coverage and performance factors are reviewed. Bryant Johnson volunteered to teach computer skills to second and third graders at an inner city school. The reason why I wanted to participate in this particular program, I thought it would be a good experience for me working with young kids and I also thought it would be a good chance to see them, see a young black male at work, you know, and willing to help them. Barbara Johnson, a courtroom deputy and no relation to Bryant, volunteered at the same school. That was just special, you know, they were just special kids. They were loving and hugging and, you know, you know, you hated to leave them sometime. Files and intake supervisor Cindy Proctor has volunteered at both her child's school and other schools. Um, it makes me want to come work here because I can go ahead and give back to either my child on a personal level or I can give back to a community um, such as the nursing home that we've went to or the D.C. public schools or something like that. It makes me feel that I'm contributing something back to the society. 
Nancy Mayor Whittington, the clerk of court, believes that rewarding high-performance employees with the opportunity to do volunteer work on worthy community projects helps her office retain quality staff. As you can see, her staff agrees. I mean, to be able to leave work, I mean, come to work in the morning, leave for two hours, come back to work. I mean, everybody can't do that, you know. A lot of jobs, you know, won't let you do something like that. And it was just to be able to help somebody. At this job, doing this volunteering makes me feel that it's just, it's much more than a job. It's like a, a family here. And you're able to do not just your job, but you're able to actually go out into the community and do other things. Like a family, we care about you, you know, not just the job, your nine to five, but also about what goes on outside of the job, because that also affects how you, how you do your job here. We hope to bring you other innovative practices in future broadcasts. And now we'd like to launch a segment that gives you a voice on our program. Once again, here's Bob. This segment is called, It's Your Turn. So what does that mean? It means that by using the CC mail address on the screen, you can send us your comments on today's program. You may also give comments at the JNET address Michael will be showing you a little later. We'll share some of your comments about today's broadcast on our next program. This is another way you can let us know if we're giving you the information that helps you do your day-to-day -day work more efficiently. We'll offer this feature on all future court-to-court -court broadcasts. Let us hear from you. Back to you, Michael. Here's that JNET address I promised you. With it, you can access information about upcoming FJTN programs. We encourage you to add this address to your bookmarks for easy access. You can also provide us with evaluations for today's program using it. Simply click on Court to Court, and you may fill out an evaluation form online. You may also fill out an opinion survey at your location and give it to your site coordinator or fax or mail it into us. See your training specialist or site coordinator if you need a copy. We want to give you as many options as possible to communicate with us. Your input is very important to developing further programming. That's Court to Court for today. On behalf of our staff here at the Federal Judicial Center, I'm Michael Burney. See you again in January.